Okay. Um, I, I rebooted it. We're going to try it again. Um, it's back on live. Um, uh, try to, try to log back on. Um, okay. Try to log back on. I apologize for that. I have no idea why it's dropping. Um, it did that last week too, uh, a week before last we had, um, we had some, some problems with it. Um, I don't know why, because I've got like all my bars, strong connection. I've got super high speed internet in my home, that 5G speed. Um, so <laughs> I have no idea why it keeps dropping everybody. Um, if it drops again, I will log back on with my phone, but we will keep it going until we are done. I apologize again. Um, I don't know why it, it um, kicked um, everybody off other than the topic that we're dealing with. <laughs> oh, man, we come against the power of the enemy. We come against the interruptions and the distractions in the name of Jesus. We apply the blood of Jesus to this stream. We say, enemy, you are held at bay. Um, and we say there will be no distractions nor interruptions in the name of Jesus. Amen. We had this problem last time. Log back on. If it drops again, we will go back on again until we are done. So hang in there with me. I don't know why it's freezing other than the topic. So we plead the blood, okay? We are in Revelation chapter five. We are in the throne room. We started last week or week before last in the throne room. Um, so chapter five continues John's vision into into that throne room, which began in chapter four. <clears throat> so let's look at some uh, precursors to this, because you remember we established that this is a, this book is written from a Hebraic perspective, um, meaning there are lots of Old Testament um, uh, illustrations. Um, the John presupposes that the reader knows the Hebrew scriptures, okay? So a lot of the imagery and the pictures are types that the people to whom um, this book was written would have understood. So we're going to peek back <clears throat> at a few passages. They're listed there in your notes. The notes are on my Facebook page. Um, let's real quick, we're going to look at just a few. Let's look at Isaiah 29 and verse 11. And the vision of all this has come to you like the words of a book that is sealed. When men give it to one who can read saying, read this, he says, I cannot for it is sealed. And so you'll find in, in these scriptures, we're going to look at that there um, was a book. Daniel saw, you know, a, a, a book and got a, a word from the Lord that had to be sealed until the, until the appropriate time. But in the revelation of Jesus Christ, Man, I felt the anointing on that. You, we're experiencing the, the breaking of those seals and the release of the revelation. So that was, that was Isaiah 29 and verse 11. There was, a, there was a particular book 
that had been sealed. Um, let's look at Ezekiel. Go um, just past um, Isaiah, past um, uh, Jeremiah, and you'll come to Ezekiel. Let's look at Ezekiel chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. Um, Ezekiel, <clears throat> let me move this keyboard and that so that I can get my Bible right in front of me. Ezekiel chapter 2, uh, verses 9 and 10. And when I looked, behold, a hand was stretched out to me, and behold, a scroll of a book was in it. And he spread it before me, and it had writing on the front and on the back, and there were written on it words of lamentation and mourning and woe. So the prophet Ezekiel catches a glimpse of this book that is written on the front and the back. We're going to look at that more in depth in a minute. But I want you to see that when John begins this description, the people to whom he was writing would have recognized this language. Okay, uh, flip over to Daniel, the book of Daniel, chapter 12, Daniel, chapter 12, and verse 4, um, but you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro and knowledge shall increase. And of course, we are in that day and age when people can run to and throw like nothing with all of the advanced technology, airplanes, um, you know, the in technology, internet, like what we're doing right now, um, Zoom, um, Instagram, uh, Facebook, all of these social mediums, knowledge has increased. And so we are in that the end of time when the seals are being broken or have been being broken off of this book. And you, depending on your end time, um, the way you interpret end time scripture. So back to Revelation chapter five. I just wanted you to see some of the uh, references in the Hebrew scriptures to a book written on the front and on the back. <clears throat> that was sealed. Now, we're back in the throne room with the Apostle John, and um, starting with chapter 5, verse 1. Then I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals. And so um, John sees, well, you know, real quick, in, in, in chapter four, um, there was a door standing open in heaven, remember, and a voice um, said, come up here and I will show you what must take place after this. So that's what he's witnessing. So he, he's in the spirit, he's caught up in the spirit. And he sees a throne with one seated on the throne. And, we, you know, we, we looked at that description, which is mind boggling. We looked at all the details of that on um, the last time. OK, and um, we, we looked at the heavenly creatures that are around the throne and the, the, the living creatures, the, all these angelic types that are crying out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and all of that. So now the one seated on the throne, he sees in his right hand um, a scroll written uh, within and on the back and sealed with seven seals. Now, one of the things that you need to know when you look at typology, um, symbolism, that type of thing, the right hand, the right hand um, uh, represents strength and authority. So here's the one seated on the throne, which is a picture of authority. And in his right hand, which is a picture of authority, um, um, uh, there is a, a book. 
in John's lifetime, books were not written on like, like this. You know, books were um, in a scroll. They, it was a piece of papyrus or vellum, and it was about 30 feet long. That's pretty long. And um, they wrote on it and, it and rolled it up, and it was sealed with clay or with wax. And so the scroll that John sees contains the full account of what God has declared prophetically. Boy, I felt that. For the world, John sees the book, the scroll, that contains the prophetic decree of God concerning the world which shall come to pass. It shall come to pass regardless of what, who thinks about it, regardless of, of um, um, whether they like it or not, regardless of whether they believe it or not. These things have been written. It has been sealed by the hand of God. Those seals are being broken and we are being ushered into the manifestation of that which God has decreed will come to pass. So John sees this book, this scroll rolled up in the mighty hand of God. And look at that verse again, the right hand of him um, who is seated on the throne, a scroll written on the front and the back, sealed with seven seals. Seven indicates, seven seals indicates the fullness of the importance of the contents. Whatever is inside this book or, or within this particular scroll, um, it, it, it is um, divine perfection. It is, it represents spiritual completion, seven seals. That means it is the fullness of, of, the, of the message that God um, has determined regarding the earth and the things that are going to happen on this ball that is flung in the midst of the vast universe that God has created. He is God, we are not seven seals indicates this message the message that is in that book that's in his hand you can you can take it to the bank it will come to pass amen all right so let's keep going um so the seven seals indicates the fullness the hebrew look at this the hebrew um for the number seven is shiva shiva and it means full or satisfied or have enough of. It's the fullness. The, what's in that scroll is the fullness of um, you know, what God intends. So as you read the revelation, um, you know, note that um, the seals are located not only on the scroll, but throughout the scroll, okay? Um, so that as each, each one is broken, more of the scroll can be read to reveal another phase of God's plan for the end time. So there are seven seals located, um, not only on the scroll, but like, or you should say, I should say throughout the scroll. Um, and each one, as each one is broken, it reveals another um, aspect or phase of God's plan for the end times. So let's look at verse two, Revelations five and verse two. John says, and I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth, in the underworld, was able, that's a very interesting phraseology, isn't it? Um, you know what? Let's look at that real quick. Um, sometimes I can find interesting things hidden in uh, these places. Let me see what that, if I can find any treasure. No one on the earth or under hupokato. Yeah, down under or beneath. That's very interesting. That I mean, what that says is that there is a realm beneath 
or under the earth, okay? Um, oh, we don't have time to get into it. But there are some who would argue for a flat earth, um, you know, type perspective. So that kind of terminology under the earth, you know, they believe that that's that, that um, Netherlands, the, you know, where those different regions of the underworld, you know, are located. The, the terminology does say no one in heaven or on the earth or under, under is the word hupokato, and it means down, under, or beneath, okay? Um, so in the center of the earth, in beneath the, the ground level of the earth, no one um, was found who was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And so John begins to weep. Verse four says, and I began to weep loudly because, so he's wailing, he's weeping loudly. Let's look at that. Um, yeah, folus, um, the Greek word is folus. Or he cried means he cried a lot, much. You know, I mean, he was, this wasn't a tear trickling. I mean, he was weeping because no one was found worthy to open the scroll, and this is significant, no one in all those heavenly types, the, the angelic creatures and the, you know, the elders and, you know, John and the angels, no one was found worthy to open the scroll or if they got it open, they couldn't look into it. That's very interesting, you know, and I guess what that said to me was that there are, you know, you have different religions, false religions from a Christian perspective. You have people who think that they, they have reached these levels of, you know, deep spiritual insight and they have looked into, you know, um, um, the spirit realm and seen that, you know, this says that there was nobody worthy to open this particular scroll or to look into it. And so John wails and one of the elders, that's the Greek word presbyteros, it means an older person, or it can mean someone who um, is um, like mature in stature or who has been given a, a, a particular level of honor. So they are an elder, one to be respected. So one of the elders says to John, weep no more or stop crying, behold or look, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David has conquered. I can't believe I didn't look up that word conquered, but I'm pretty sure it's that, that word that we know. It's that word nikao, where we get Nike, nikao, uh, uh, nike, nikao, nike, you know, that whoosh symbol that the gym shoe is, is made out of. That's an ancient Greek word. And it means to overcome, to get the victory. So the, one of the elders says to John, stop crying. The lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David has overcome. He has conquered. He has gotten the victory so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. So look, here's what this means. Here's what this means. Only Jesus, our Christ, Jesus the Christ, Jesus the Messiah, only Jesus is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll that will unleash the apocalypse and lead to the consummation. And remember, the apocalypse is the unveiling of the fullness of Christ, the lion and the lamb, okay? He's the one who is worthy to break the seals and begin to unleash the apocalypse, the unveiling, and lead to the uh, consummation of his rule with God, his father, and his rule with those whose believing loyalty remains true to the end, okay? So 
Um, in other words, if you to rule and reign with Christ, it, it requires more than you um, getting baptized as a kid and then you live like the devil for the rest of your life. No, 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 no. That those who rule and reign with him are those who believe and who remain loyal and true to him to the end, okay? You must persevere. You cannot get wet, you know, in the baptismal pool at somebody's church and then spend the next five, six, seven, eight, however, however long you live, however many decades you live on this planet and then you live like the world, you are not one of those overcomers, okay? Stop playing games, Okay, I'm back. I went somewhere in my head. But this, this, th those who rule with him are those who whose believing loyalty remains true. So Jesus, the Lion of Judah, proved himself worthy to break the seals and open the scroll. And he did it by living a perfect life of obedience to God dying on the cross for the sins of the world and rising from the dead to show his power and authority over death, sin, evil, hell, and the grave. Amen. He is the one who is worthy. So the um, elder says to John, man, stop crying. Behold the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David. Don't worry, he has conquered. He has kicked butt and took names and he can open the scroll and break its seals. So he is the only one who has conquered sin, death, hell, and Satan himself. So only Jesus can be trusted with the world's future. You have to get that. He is the only one who can be trusted. You can put your faith and your hope and your confidence in him. He is the only one who can be trusted, not um, uh, uh, your favorite political party. It doesn't matter which one you align with. That's not who you can trust who the only one you can really trust with the world's future is the Lord Jesus Christ, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the lamb of God. Um, that expression root of David is a prophetic reference to the Messiah coming from the line of David. That, that expression that you find um, in uh, Revelations 5 and verse 5, it is a prophetic reference to the Messiah coming from the lineage of David. And um, again, remember, his audience would have understood that. But you and I, let's look at Genesis 49 and verse number 10. And it says, um, um, well, let's, let's start with, um, let's start with verse eight in Genesis 49. Judah, your brothers shall praise you. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's sons will bow down before you. Now this is talking about the actual, um, son of, um, one of the sons of, of Jacob, whose name was Judah, um, Judah, but it's, it's speaking prophetically as well. Verse nine, Judah is a lion's cub from the prey. My son, you have gone up. He stooped down. He crouched as a lion and as a lioness who dares rouse him. And this is the verse we were looking for right here. Verse 10, the scepter, that's the, 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 the instrument that the king holds in his hand that represents his, his realm, his power and his authority. This says the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler staff from between his feet until tribute comes to him and to him shall be the obedience of the people. And um, it's a prophetic reference to um, the Messiah coming through the line 
of Judah. The scepter will not depart from Judah. So back to Revelation chapter 5. And we will then pick it up with verse 6. And between the throne and the four living creatures, that word there that's translated living creatures is the word zoon, zoon. And it looks like zoon in English, but it kind of has an accent on the last half. So it's zoon. Um, and it means a living thing, a living being, some type of living beast, these angelic creatures between the throne and these four living things and among the elders. Like, so between the throne and these living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain. That is the Greek word sphazo. Sfazo, and it means to put to death by violence, mortally wounded. That's a very interesting picture um, with seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. So what in the world does John see? John sees between the throne, the one seated on the throne, no doubt, is God the Father at, in this particular scene. He sees the four living creatures and he sees the lamb standing as though it had been mortally wounded or put to death by violence. You could tell, with, and looking at this lamb, that this lamb had been slain and been slain violently. Okay, seven horns. So note that Jesus is pictured in, in this chapter as both a fierce lion, which represents authority and power. And he's also pictured as a, a lamb, which represents his complete submission to God's will. He is the lion and the lamb. Uh, one of the elders tells John to look Behold the lion, and which is interesting. Go back. Go. Okay, let me just look down instead of in my notes. Um, in in Revelations five verse five, look. The elder says, "Remember, weep no more. Behold the lion of the tribe of Judah." So when John looks to behold the lion, he sees a lamb. Isn't that interesting? He sees a lamb. So Jesus is pictured as both the lion and the lamb. It's like blink, you see the lion, blink, you see the lamb. He's both. One of the elders tells him, behold the lion. But when he looks, he sees the lamb. He sees a lamb standing. And what does that mean? The lamb is, was this lamb, um, um, as though it had been slain, put to death violently. It is a picture of the perfect sacrifice for sin that had been made. Therefore, he is the only one who can save us from the terrible events that are revealed in the scroll. Only this, this lamb that was slain can save us from the, the, the terrible events revealed by the scroll. He has proved himself through his death on the cross. So his death was the defeat of the forces of evil, regardless of what it looks like in the earth, regardless of what's happening around you in your life, Jesus has overcome. He has um, nikao, he has conquered and overcome. And because he has conquered and overcome, you are a conqueror and overcomer, regardless of what it looks like in the natural, what is ultimately true, what will be eternally true, what is true now in the spirit realm, even if it doesn't appear to be manifesting in the natural, the book says he has conquered. He is the one standing. He is the one who has overcome. He was the perfect sacrifice, okay? And so he is the only one that can save you from the events that are coming. You Listen, you need to get that. Not aligning with some world leader or some world system that is coming. If you watch the news, 
You can see the nations realigning. Look at what's happening in Russia and Ukraine and China and around the world. The United States, how the United States has, has slipped into a pit of moral depravity, losing its, its power and influence in the earth because people went to the polls and voted for a man in the, you know, um, latent phases of clear cognitive decline. Why in the world would anybody put nuclear codes in the hands of, of a man who demonstrates that type of compromise cognitively? But that's the stuff that Americans do or appear to be done anyway. That's debatable. We won't talk about that. But look, you cannot put your confidence in any of that, I'm telling you, because all of them, regardless of party, they are all crazy and they are not your redemption, not your savior. Only the perfect sacrifice. He's the only one in whom we're going to find redemption, okay? Um, so his death was the defeat of the forces of evil, even though when you, re we have just come through Holy Week, we came through Palm Passion Sunday, um, I taught last week, um, or maybe I did do Bible study last week, oh, I just didn't do Revelation, I did that teaching on the sequence of events, what happened, we know Jesus was not crucified on Friday, okay, it would have been, the events would have started Wednesday at sunset, which was Thursday on the, for, for a Hebraic day. By Thursday morning, our time, which would have been midway through their Thursday, he was already on the cross. And before the sun went down Thursday night, he was dead and put into the grave, okay? So um, anyway, um, he was the perfect sacrifice. And even though it looked like all had been lost when he breathed his last and said, it is finished. He meant the victory. The victory had been accomplished. Listen, our redemption, the price had been paid. The lamb had been sacrificed. Our Passover had been manifest. We went from the type and the shadow to the real manifest lamb of God. His, his death was not defeat. His death was victory over the forces of evil. It was the defeat of the forces of evil. And it's up to you and I to remind the enemy of that when he wants to come against us in this earth realm. And so the lion will lead the final battle where Satan is eternally and ultimately defeated. And let's just peek ahead real quick. Just peek ahead to Revelation just for fun. Peek ahead to Revelation chapter 19 and look at verses 19 through 21. We're going to peek ahead. Okay, look at this. And I saw the beasts and the kings of the earth with their armies gathered to make war against him who was sitting on the horse and against his army. And the beast was captured and with it the false prophet who in its presence had done the signs by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshiped his image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur and the rest were slain by the sword that came. The sword is a type of the word. The, the sword of the spirit is the spoken word of God. Look at this. They were slain by the sword that came from the mouth, the spoken word of God, of him who was sitting on the horse and all of the birds were gorged with their flesh. Listen, Listen, the enemy is defeat. We, we're going to win. Okay. It's already been done. Remember the book that, that the one seated on the throne is holding. It has already deter. He has already determined these things. There is no wiggle room. We're going to win. You want to be on the winning side. Okay. You don't want to be playing games. All right. Look at this. We will participate in his victory because of our faith in him. <clears throat> okay, so notice 
the lamb had been slain. This is looking at um, um, uh, Revelations chapter 5 and verse 6. Um, he saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain. And so this pictures, again, the wounds inflicted upon Jesus during his trial and crucifixion. Which is interesting is even in eternity, he still bears the scars, which are proof, evidence of his having been slain and his having triumphed over the enemy and the price having been fully paid for our redemption, okay? He still bear, <clears throat> matter of fact, when you read in, in, in the gospel narratives and in the book of Acts, um, re remember um, the disciples on the road to Emmaus that when he pretends that he's going to go on, they invite him in to eat. And when they begin the meal and he breaks the bread, when he tears the bread and imagine him breaking the bread like that. Let me see so you can see my hands. Him tearing the bread. And you know, if he was wearing a garment with sleeves at that point, the sleeves would have slipped up his arm and they would have seen the scars and he was revealed to them. Go back and read it for yourself, see? And so he still bears the marks of his victory, okay? Come on, think about it prophetically. Many of you have scars on your heart. Maybe God has healed that season in your life, but the scars are there on your life as evidence that you went through and that God brought you out. The scars are, don't let anybody or the enemy whisper in your ear and tell you that you're still this or you're still that because they can see the scars. The scars are proof of the redemptive work of Christ in your life. Listen, let me tell you, I, let me tell you, I, rem I knew this guy years ago. His name, he was a prophet. His name was Donald Baines. I don't even know if he's still alive. This was in Florida. And Donald got saved in prison before he went to prison for like prostitution and drugs, that kind of thing. He, he was on the streets. His name was Donna, Donna. But when he got saved, he, matter of fact, he had begun the process to become a transgender person. He a, a male to female transgender. When he got in, when he went to prison, he got saved for real and began to reverse the process. And so after he got out of prison, there were some people who would still look at him and tell him that he was still somewhat effeminate as he was in that healing process that God was, God had done a tremendous redemptive work in his life. But you have the enemy and, and, and critical people who wanted to look at him and say, well, you know, that he was still this, he was still that. And he would tell people, listen, I am light years away from high heel shoes and pantyhose and walking the street as a prostitute. I'm here to tell you about what Christ has done in my life and what you see as perhaps still being something that appears to be somewhat effeminate are the scars. It's the residue of the redemptive work that Christ has come, has, has begun in his life and God was not finished with him yet. I'm just saying, so listen, don't let the enemy make you feel bad about some of the scar tissue that is left in your flesh from the work that God has done in your life. If you've ever had surgery, you have a scar. Okay, I'm just saying. So here is our lamb who appears as one who had been slain the wounds inflicted in his trial and crucifixion. When we see him, you know what? We're going to be undone, undone in his presence because we will realize that his scars that he bears is because of us. Okay. He is the lamb of God 
He is our Passover. Okay, let's look at it real quick. Keep, let me put a ribbon. Keep the ribbon in Revelations 5. And let's look at it. We, we, we are gathering our stones of proof. Um, let's look at John 129. We'll start there and then we'll flip forward. John 129. John 1 and verse 20, um, uh, 29. 29. Um, the next day, he saw Jesus coming toward him. This is John, like uh, speaking of John the Baptist. John the Baptist sees Jesus coming toward him and he says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Okay, flip forward to, Rev to John 20, John chapter 20, verses 24 through 31. Now, Thomas, one of the 12 called the twin, was not with them um, when Jesus came. This is after the resurrection when several people have seen him alive. Thomas don't believe it, okay? So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Now, we like to point fingers at Thomas and we like to think that we are so far beyond him or that we are perhaps more mature than him. But why do you think Jesus still bears those scars? You know, they're, they're proof. They are proof of what God has done, of what, what he has done for us. They are the sign. They're the evidence, okay? Um, so look, okay, keep going. Let's see, where are we? John uh, 20, um, verse 26. Eight days later, his disciples were again inside and Thomas was with them. Um, although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands. In other words, he still bears the marks, okay? And put you out your hand and place it in my side. He still bears the mark. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Look at Isaiah 53, Isaiah 53 and verse seven, Isaiah 53 and verse seven. Um, he was oppressed and afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Go to Hebrews, go forward in the New Testament to the book of Hebrews. Uh, the book of Hebrews, where do you live, Hebrews? You live back before James. Uh, Hebrews chapter 10, let's look at this passage in Hebrews 10. For since the law has but a shadow of the things, um, the good things to come instead of the true form of these realities, it can never by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise would they not have ceased to be offered since the worshipers having once been cleansed would, by no, would no longer have any consciousness of sins. But in these sacrifices, there's a reminder of sins every year. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. Consequently, when Christ or when the Messiah came into the world, he said, sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings, you have taken no pleasure. Um, 
Then I said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written of me in the scroll of the book. Okay, there's that scroll again. When he said above, you have neither desired nor taken pleasure in sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and sin offerings. These are offered according to the law. Then he added, behold, I have come to do your will. He does away with the first in order to establish the second. And by that, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. And every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when Christ, when the Messiah had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sin, he sat down. Now, a priest never sits down in the presence of God. This priest sits down because he is done. He's finished the, the sacrifice. He sat down at the right hand of God, okay? So he is the lamb. He is our Passover. So in this passage, in Hebrews 5, where we see a lamb standing as though it had been slain, this is verse 6, with seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Let's look at that. The seven horns symbolize strength and power, the fullness of strength. Remember seven, that number that means fullness or perfection. So when you, when you, um, uh, when you see the lamb standing, the lamb standing with seven horns, that means this lamb, um, um, the picture of that which has been slain is the picture of perfect power perfected, okay? Strength and power perfected. Now that's very interesting because that perfect power had was demonstrated through humility and sacrifice. My throat is so dry. <clears throat> so sometimes victory, the way to victory is not up but down through humility. Oh, sometimes that's the way we find victory. The fullness of strength and power of this lamb was depicted by giving his life. Okay, I'm just saying. Okay, look at... What are we going to look at? We're going to look at 1 Kings, flip back real fast to the Old Testament, 1 Kings 22 and verse 11, just to show you these types and shadows that the people to whom this letter was written would have known and would have understood. And Zedekiah, the son of Kenaah, 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 Kenaana, Kenaana, made for himself horns of iron and said, thus says the Lord, with these you shall push the Syrians until they are destroyed. Horns being a picture of power and strength. Look at Zechariah, go further um, up in the Old Testament to the prophets, into the prophets and find Zechariah. Where are you, Zechariah? You live past Daniel. Where are you, Zechariah? Zechariah lives next door to... Oh, that's Zephaniah. Oh, there's Zechariah. He lives back there by Zephaniah. <laughs> uh, Haggai and then Zechariah. Okay, Zechariah 1 and verse 18... And I lifted my eyes and saw, and behold, four horns 
Um, so you'll see these are the horns that have scattered Judah and Israel and Jerusalem. Again, horns are picture, pictures in the Old Testament of power and strength, okay? And so that typology is picked up. I just wanted you to see that. So the seven horns symbolize uh, strength and power also. So although Jesus is our sacrificial lamb, this lamb has seven horns. So even though he is a lamb, the perfect sacrifice, our Passover, he is the picture of power and strength perfected as demonstrated through love and humility, self-sacrifice. Man, you need to just meditate on that for a minute. Meditate on that for a while because we tend to see power and strength in a different way. You know, we, we, we think that laying down your life is um, a sign of weakness, but I'm telling you that it was in weakness. The scripture says that we are, we are made strong. Okay. So Jesus was in no way weak. What, what looks like weakness is the epitome of strength. Okay. He willingly went to the cross willingly. Okay. Um, his death was victory and not defeat. So there are seven horns, which, um, pictures a lamb perfect in strength and power. This lamb has seven eyes, seven eyes. That's a, that's a, is John is seen prophetically and he's writing in English using Old Testament typology and symbolism to um, portray a particular meaning. And the seven eyes would be complete spiritual vision, sight, discernment, and knowledge. Okay, so this lamb is by no means weak. He is the epitome of perfect strength and power. He is the epitome of perfect vision, discernment, and knowledge. Okay, that's good. And this is equated, look at it, um, which are these seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God. Again, this is the fullness of the spirit of God. So you see all of it there. You see um, all that perfection um, uh, rolled in together in the Lamb of God. Um, look at Zechariah 4 um, and verses 2 through 10. Um, the, well, start at verse 1. And the angel who talked with me came again and woke me like a man who is awakened out of his sleep. And he said to me, what do you see? And I said, I see and behold a lampstand, all of gold with a bowl on the top of it and seven lamps on it and seven lips on each of the lamps that are on the top of it. And there are two olive trees by it, one on the right of the bowl and one on his left. And I said to the angel who talked with me, what are these, my Lord? Then the angel who talked with me answered and said to me, do you not know? And notice in that passage that the word Lord is in small letters. So it is simply a term of respect and honor. It's not a reference to the yod heh vav -He Lord, okay? Um, this is it's just a term of honor, like saying sir, that type of thing. Verse five, then the angel who talked with me answered and said to me, do you not know what these are? And I said, no, my Lord, or no, sir. Then he said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Who are you, O great mountain, before Zerubbabel? You shall become a plain, and he shall bring forward the top stone amid shouts of grace, grace to it. Then the word of the Lord came to me saying, the hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house. His hands also shall um, complete it. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. For whoever has despised the day of small things shall rejoice and shall see the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel. Now look at this. 
These seven are the eyes of the Lord, which range through the whole earth. So again, it's the fullness of spiritual vision, sight, discernment, knowledge, fullness of strength and power that is perfected in the lamb of God that was slain. Amen. I hope that those images are making sense to you. This is perfect authority and power that now belongs to the Lamb of God that was slain. Okay, uh, let's look at verse 7. Let's go on. Revelations 5 and verse 7. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures, and so um, this, the one who goes to take the scroll, that would be the lamb, okay, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. So, so the Lord goes, he takes the scroll from the hand of he who is seated on the throne, God the Father. Um, uh, and verse eight, and when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. So now everything that we just described, the lamb of God, perfect in power and strength, perfect in vision and might and spiritual power. He <clears throat> moves from where he is standing to the throne to take the scroll. And as he moves in all of his splendor and majesty and strength and vision and power, the 24 elders fell down. Now this word, you know me, I, I like to look things up to see like, what is that about? That is the Greek word pipto. It means they thrust down. I mean, uh, you know, have you ever been in a, have you ever been in a service where the glory, I mean, the weighty glory of God swept over you and your knees buckle and you are thrust to the floor? I, I don't know. I've had ex experiences like that where the weight of God pushed you to the floor. You were thrust down prostrate. That happened to me at Exousia back in the day. I'll never forget that. I've had that happen uh, on, on various occasions where the Lord, the power of God just thrust me to the floor. Now imagine that. Imagine that. Go, Come on, we're in the throne room. See the one seated on the throne in all of his glory, what, what you can see of him because he's so glorious, but you can see the lamb who was slain, who, who is perfect in power and strength, the lion of the tribe of Judah and the lamb of God, strength and power perfected, fullness of the spirit of God resting upon him. He moves to the throne to take the scroll. And as he does, Everything in there, the four living creatures and the 24 elders are pipto. They are thrust down. <laughs> Come on, prostrate. They are overcome with astonishment. That's what that word pipto means. You're welcome. I thought you'd like to know that. That just blesses my soul. You know, it brings the text to life. It brings it alive. You know, they fell down. The weight of his glory helped them get on their face, in other words, okay? They were thrust down in awe and astonishment because this isn't authority or strength or power. This is the fullness. This is authority and strength and power perfected, people. Are you guys out there? And they were thrust down, each one of them holding a, a harp. Uh, now, it says a harp. That's the word kithara. Kita, kit, kithara, yeah, that's right. Kithara in the Greek, a harp to which praises of God are, are sung. That should be sung. It's a typo in heaven. So to me, it's a harp. It's a, it's a stringed instrument, you know? It's a, I, I like to think, man... That the guitar, you know, anyway, that's just me having a moment in my head. 
you know, worshiping God on the string instrument. They held a harp. But you know, I'm going to actually, I've seen a type of um, one of those harps like David would have played and probably like they were holding in their hand. I'm going to order one of those things and just to just to have it in my collection. But they had a harp in one hand, which um, represents the praises of God that are sung in heaven and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the people. Now look at that. Let's not rush past that. They have a harp or they have praise and worship in one hand and they have um, golden bowls full. That's the word gemo, gemo in the Greek. It means bowls that were swelling, overflowing with incense, which are the prayers of the saints down through the ages. The prayers of the saints of God going up before the Lord. Put, leave your finger there in Revelation and flip back to the book of Psalms. Uh, Psalms 141, I believe it is. This is one of my life verses because I heard the Lord say this to me. I've told you guys before. I heard the Lord say this, this to me one day in my car as I was driving down the road and praying and, and I was just driving and praying and, and my daughter was in the back seat and um, she was real little then. And, um, and I was praying and I was telling the Lord, Lord, I just, I wanted my prayer life to be different <clears throat> than it was. And I was telling them, I want my prayers I just want my prayers to, and I didn't know how to articulate it. <clears throat> and um, the Holy Spirit said this to me. He said, you want your prayers to be like incense before me. And he filled the car with the smell of this incense that is mentioned in this passage. I believe that when I get to heaven, I'm going to recognize that smell. Okay, look at this. Psalm 141. Oh, what time is it? Oh, we got to go faster. And verse two, let my prayer be counted as incense before you and the lifting of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Come on. The scriptures tell us that there is a place in prayer where our prayers ascend to him like incense and they are captured in the bowls that the elders hold, okay? So they, they go down and I mean, just kind of picture it. They're thrust down, them, their harps and their bowls face down before the lamb. <laughs> that is good, good, good. Look, worship and praise and prayer like incense. That's what's happening in that room. And look at verse nine. Let's look at verse nine in Revelations chapter five. Um, and they sang a new song. Now this experience, as they see him in the fullness of his strength and majesty and vision and power and sacrifice, they, they're thrust face down by the weight of his glory. You know, okay, I'm, I'm gonna leave that alone, okay? <laughs> you, I, I, my prayer for you is that you encounter him like that. If you ever see him like that and encounter his glory, I don't care who you are, you will not remain on your feet. And they sang a new song saying, worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals for you were slain and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. So let's look at this. They sang a new, that's the Greek word, kainos. It means uh, a new kind, a, an, an unprecedented. They sang an unprecedented song. They sang an, a, a new, an unheard of. I mean, in that moment, 
in that moment where they're undone by his glory and the revelation of just him moving through the room. <laughs> Just him moving through the room causes them to sing a new song, a new kind and unprecedented song, Ode, Ode in the Greek, a chant. They break out and I, you know, I went somewhere in my mind when, you know, and I was thinking, man, they just begin to spit a rhyme, as my son would say, a chant. They started, or I don't know how many of you have ever, I used to have some CDs of, the, I think they were what they call Gregorian chants, some monks that used to do this ancient type of, it's real ethereal, deep chanting sound, singing, you know, the scripture. They're singing a new and unprecedented, unheard of kind of chant, like song. And then it doesn't give you the melody, but it tells you what they were saying. Okay. Here was the words to the, the new song. Worthy. That's axios. Deserving. Weighty are you. Worthy. You are due all reward. Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. They see this is the one, the lion and the lamb. He's worthy, particularly the lamb part of him, to take the scroll and open its seals. In other words, to begin to release the purposes and plans of God in its fullness into the earth. For you were slain and by your blood, you ransomed agorazo. You bought, you redeemed, you purchased people for God. You ransomed, you paid the ransom. I am going to write that book because the Lord gave me that in a dream. Ransomed, my new podcast, which I need to release um, it's called Ransom 487 um, because I am convinced and it's really been on my heart, particularly after doing two funerals last week, that it, what it, people need to know what it means to be ransomed. When you have been ransomed by God and you know it, when you have been redeemed, purchased, you should not be living like a slave and you have been ransomed. If you are still a slave to sin, if you are still a slave to debauchery and, you know, um, lasciviousness and, you know, bad attitudes, vices, you know, just evil, you know, conniving, you are living like someone who is still in prison and who has, who someone who doesn't have a revelation that you you have been ransomed, redeemed, purchased by God. You can come out of that bondage, out of those prisons and live a different kind of way. I'm going to put that all together woo, 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 in a book coming up real soon. Um, I actually have some time scheduled. I think I'm going to do a writing retreat um, in June and just get away by myself and, and, and get that book out. A worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals for you were slain and by your blood you ransomed. Somebody ought to say, amen. People for God from every tribe and every language and people and nation so that nobody is left out. Doesn't matter your skin color, your demographics, your socioeconomic status. He, he paid the price for yes, you too. And you have made them, who? The people that you ransomed by your blood. You have made them a kingdom, a basileia, a royal power, people with dignity and kingship, those who have dominion and rule under Christ and people who not only you have made them a kingdom, but they are priests. Um, that word in the Greek is a metaphor for Christians because they have been purified by the blood of Christ and brought into close intercourse with God so that they devote their life to him alone and to Christ. And so we are a, a kingdom, uh, people of royal dignity and priests, people who serve our God and we shall reign. That's that Basileia again. We shall rule and reign with him on the earth. And here's the thing that is interesting about that 
in the Greek, the present tense of the Greek verb reign, they shall reign with him, indicates that the reign of believers, we do not have to wait until the end of the end of the end and the culmination, a consummation of all things. We have already begun to reign. It is in the present tense in the Greek. And so look at it. You have made them a kingdom and priest to our God and they shall reign on on the earth, present tense, they reign on the earth. We should be reigning right now. We should be living like people who are a kingdom of priests unto God, who have been ransomed by the blood of the lamb, who are the subjects of the lion of the tribe of Judah. Stop living like people who are still in sin and in prison um, by the enemy. He has been defeated, Nikao. He has been conquered. The victory was accomplished on the cross. The consummation of it is coming. But listen, beloved, Jesus whipped his butt, took names, led captivity, cap. He descended into the depths of the earth, not to continue to suffer for you because he finished it on the cross, but he descended into the underworld to lead captivity captive, to proclaim his victory to all the principalities and power so that they would know that they know that they know that when he took his last breath that they didn't win, he did. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? Go there in your, in your imagination. Go into that moment. Okay. <clears throat> Let me come back. I went somewhere in my head. Okay. Verse 11. Oh, we got to keep going. <clears throat> Then I looked and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders, the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands. That essentially means 10 thousands, 10 thousands of 10 thousands and thousands of thousands. If you really count that literally, where it says many angels, then I looked and I heard around the throne, the living creatures and the elders and the many, over 110 million angels saying with a megaphone, megaphone, loud voice, worthy. Can, oh, That'll shake you to your knees right there. Just the sound of the company of heaven proclaiming worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power, dunamis, and wealth, plutos, fullness, abundance, plentitude, riches, and wealth, and wisdom, and might, and honor, and glory, and blessing. Now listen, this blessing is the word eulogia. Um, it means, it's where we get the word eulogy. This is what I was doing this weekend. It means commendation, fine speaking. As a pastor, it's my responsibility when I do the eulogy to speak well of the individual, regardless of what you thought about them, because you do not spell Bernardine G-O-D. You don't. And guess what, beloved? You don't spell your name G-O-D either. And so you do not determine a person's eternal destiny. God does. When I do a eulogy, it is my responsibility to come in and speak well of them. Okay. And I entrust their eternal destiny into God's hands. And I speak to the family and I let the family know that this is a moment of grace. This is God's grace to you. This moment is about you, not about the deceased even though you think it is, this is God giving you the opportunity to look death in the face, touch death, kiss death, wave goodbye to death without having to go through the door yourself. That is grace because it gives you the opportunity to determine in your own heart and life whether you are ready to be laid out in state yourself. Okay, I'm back. And so you lo gay o commendation, fine speaking. That means they were, they were praising and giving laud, laudation and fine discourse. They speaking well of the Lord because he's worthy. See, and I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Look at that. 
every creature in heaven, on earth, and in the underworld, and in the sea, and all of them, all of them saying, they can't help but say, because it's true, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, <laughs> be blessing and glory and honor and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures say, Amen. And the elders fall down on their face under the weight of his glory. They And they worship, they worship, they do reverence and honor to him. Okay, let me take just five minutes because we got cut off and we started a little bit late. So I know it looks like I'm out of time, but just give me five minutes. So that is the end of chapter five. Now, I need to tell you this because I think this is the order that we're going to do this book. I know that people want to get into the breaking of the seals, <laughs> you know, but could it be true that the, the book of Revelation is not written in chronological order. If you read it through in the order it is written, it does not make sense to you. That's why people don't read it and they don't understand it. Could it be that it is not in chronological order, but if you put it back in what seems like a logical, coherent chronological order, it will make all the sense in the world to you. So I have, uh, on, in past um, emails, I've given you a copy of, you know, I put the, I, I took this order and I put it all together. This is actually from a book um, um, called The Mystery of the Book of Revelation. And in it, this guy that, oh, what is the pastor's name? Um, a, a pastor who was trying to understand these things like, like we are, and he, um, it wasn't making sense. And so his name is John Story. And um, he began to pray into it. And the Lord began to show him that um, in Revelations 1, verses 1 and 2, uh, look at real quick, just, just give me like five minutes to establish this. And then we're going to pick it up next week. Look at this, Revelations 1. Verses one and two, the revelation of Jesus Christ was God gave him to show his servants the things much, which must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant, John, who bore witness, okay, to the word, okay, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. And so the Lord began to give John this revelation. And then there are a couple of times in the book of Revelation where, where uh, what John is writing that Jesus gave him is interrupted by this angel who comes, who gives him like commentary or a deeper insight, testify, verification of what he was receiving from Christ. Are you with me? And so um, that is what happens if when you're reading the book. So, for instance, there are five different interpretations for the timing of the book. Pre-trip, mid-trip, pre-wrath, post-trip, you know, um, you know pre-trip, pre mid-trip, pre-wrath, post-trip, pre full and partial pre -trip. Five different interpretations. All those people are not right, okay? So not all of the book is in chronological order. It's not. And if you read it, you'll see that. If you read Revelation chapter 10, an angel interrupts John and gives him a second smaller scroll. And then the angel tells John to write about the things that he had already written about. Well, the angel is giving him commentary or explanation. Like when you're reading your Bible and oops, all of a sudden you'll see commentary that takes you back to other, like we just did in our teaching. We looked at things that we said, oh, hold that. Let's go back and look at this. That's what's happening in the book of Revelation. Are you with me? Okay. So John had been writing about the wrath of God in the form of seven trumpets of God's wrath. And then if you read through that, you'll right in the middle of it, um, you know, there's like an interruption. Something else begins to happen. Well, listen, beloved, once God starts pouring out his wrath, there will be no interruptions. Okay. He's going to pour it out until it's empty. So Revelations chapters 11 through 14 are out of chronological order. 
At the end of, Reve of Revelation 16, there's another angelic interruption. So you have 17, 18, and 19 that are also out of sequence. The revelation given to John by Jesus is the ultimate foundation of the book. But what the angel testifies to is additional footnotes which overlay the message to give a clearer understanding of what's happening in the end times. So it, when you put it back in order, it makes better sense. So here's what I need you to do. This week, I need you to read the book of Revelation in this order. Revelations chapter 1 through 514, which we, we've studied over these 10 sessions. Then instead of going to chapter 6, we're going to go to chapter 6 verses 1 and 2. Then we're going to go to Revelations 13, then 14, then back to 6. Then we're going to, you know, put in the commentary, Revelations 11, 14, 17, back to 14, 7. We're going to put it back in order. And if you want to know um, more, you can um, get this book. Uh, let me get it so you can see it. Unlocking the Mystery of the book of Revelation, the unveiling of what was sealed by John story. And I, I dare you to get it and read it, okay? All right, beloved, I'm out of time. I love being with you and um, opening the word of God um, for you. I'm glad that my, my Aunt Mary um, was blessed and that my, my cousin Mary um, and each and every one of you, my cousin Terry, family is family though, you know? Um, God bless you for being with me on these Tuesday nights. Um, if this is a blessing to you and you want to sow into it, you can do so through um, Soterios Ministries. I don't know where Gladys is. Normally she puts those links in for me. She's been falling off her job. Where is Gladys? Um, normally she puts the, <laughs> the links in for me. But Soterios Ministries, you can give through um, PayPal. You can give through our app. All of those are um, protected ways for you to sow, and you can give through um, Cash App. The most protected way, I think, is through my app, my Soterios Ministries app. Um, let's see. I'm going to put it in there because I don't see Gladys um, putting it in. So it's um, paypal.me forward slash S-T-R-I-S, Soterios Ministries. Um, that link will take you to a place where you can sow into um, the ministry. You can also give at um, dollar sign Dr. Bernie S-M-I. That's Cash App. And all of those go directly into Soterios. They do not go into my pocket. And then, of course, the other one is my Soterios Ministries app. Okay. God bless you, beloved. I will see you next time. God willing. And the creek don't rise, as they say. Um, read the book of Revelation in this order that I put in your notes. And then let me know what you think about that. It, it, it should make more sense to you. Okay. All right. Take care. And I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.